بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. This is the ayah which essentially made fasting obligatory on Muslims. It became one of the five pillars of Islam. There are three things in this ayah that we learn. Uh, it is ayah number 183 in Surah Baqarah. The ayah says first that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum as siyam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it has been written, Kutiba is a passive form of to write. Kutiba, it has been written, or it means it has been ordained, or it has been commanded. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands and does things through speech. And I'll come to that in a moment, what I mean by Allah Ta'ala does things through speech. So when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala orders something, He writes it and so says, it has been written, it has been ordained, it has been commanded upon you to fast. That is the first thing, it says it has become obligatory upon us. The second thing that this ayah tells us, that it is not new. And it has become obligatory upon us, as it was obligatory upon people before us. As it was upon those people who came before us. But what is also interesting is that this ayah also tell us, tells us what is the purpose of fasting. What is the purpose of making fasting obligatory? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَقْتَقُونَ So that in order that you become muttaqeen. The word muttaqeen is understood as being God-fearing or God-conscious or being aware of God. Uh, after discussing the next ayah, I will try and explain in the context of this ayah specifically what the word tattakun really means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in ayah 2, 185, Muslim Allah Rahim, شَهْرُ وَمَدَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنَ أُذَلِّ النَّاسِ it is in the month of Ramadan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran as guidance to humanity. There is one very interesting tradition in which the Prophet said that all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's revelations were revealed in the month of Ramadan. The, the, the suhoof to Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Torah to Musa alayhi salam, the Injil to Isa, the Psalms to David. All of them were revealed in the month of Ramadan and he actually mentions dates and goes on and ends the tradition by saying that on the night of the 24th of Ramadan the Quran was revealed. It is very difficult to understand what it really means because we know that the Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years. We know that the Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years. It's not necessary that every verse of the Quran was revealed in the month of Ramadan, it is possible that some of, it is clear that some of the verses were not revealed in the month of Ramadan. So what do we understand? And one of the explanations that scholars have offered to this is to say that there are two stages of revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, see the Quran is the Arabic version of that book which is safely with Allah in Loh and Mahfuz that book which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has safely guarded, the Quran is the Arabic version of it. So the first descent of that book was in the month of Ramadan, perhaps on the night of the 23rd or 24th of Ramadan, and the second descent was over the period of 23 years in the life of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa min al -huda wal He defines this Quran. He says, this Quran was revealed to you in the month of Ramadan, and what is it? It is clear proofs. It is clear proofs of guidance and Furhan. Furhan is a very interesting word. Furhan means it is the criteria to judge between what is right and what is wrong. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Quran has these two characteristics. It, characteristics. it is it is proofs. It is proofs of guidance. So it's not just just statements. There is proofs in it. There is argumentation. There is hujja in it. And the second thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it gives you the capacity or the knowledge by which you can also distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. So it is like a, a normative balance. So the Quran is like this balance in which you can distinguish between what is sahih and what is halat, what is right and what is wrong. 
And that is the importance of the Quran. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ أَشْشَهَدْ فَلْيَسُمْهُ Anybody who has witnessed the beginning of the month of Ramadan has to fast in it. Prior to the revelation of this ayah, some of the Muslims used to fast, and some did not fast, but they would give to them. So they would feed poor people. Even healthy people would not fast if they were wealthy, and they would feed. But after this ayah, it became very clear that it is fasting is obligatory on everybody except if you're not well, and if you are traveling, and then concessions are made for women who are pregnant, nursing, or in periods. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that for men kana maridan aw ala safrin fa iddatan min ayyamin ukhra. So if you're traveling, if you're unwell, you miss certain number of fasts, you replace those number of fasts on different days. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then proceeds to say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, yurid Allah bikum ayyusra wal yuridu bikum al-usra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to make things difficult for you, He just wants to make things easy for you. Allah says that complete this period of fasting, which is important. So he wants you to fast the whole month from Allah. Complete this period of fasting in order to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be grateful for this guidance. So in the previous ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he wants us to fast so that we become muttaqeen. And in the second ayah, he's saying he is expecting us to fast so that we become uh, tashkurun, those who are grateful. So that we, we express our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are we expressing gratitude for? Elsewhere Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a very beautiful and a powerful ayah of the Quran, he says, I found you lost. When I found you, you were lost. And I guided you. And how did he guide us as human beings? We were lost. He guided us through the revelation of the Father. He revealed it in the month of Ramadan and he guided us. So these are the two things you must understand. It is obligatory on all of us to fast if we have been fortunate enough to witness the month of Ramadan. And we fast in order to become muttaqeen, and we also fast in order to express our gratitude to God who has sent us guidance in the form of the Quran. The Quran and Ramadan are inseparable. They are like twins. You must always understand that they are like twins. You can't separate the two. That's why one of the biggest forms of ibadah that you can do in this month is to recite the Quran, to read the Quran, to understand the Quran, come closer to the Quran. Now coming to this concept of muntaqeen, some people say it's about khawf, it's taqwa. The best way to understand taqwa is the fear that you have in your heart of displeasing God. This fear that, oh my God, if I do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be angry with me. Oh my God, if I do this, I may violate his rules. Oh my God, if I do this, I may be doing something that is wrong and misguided. That fear is taqwa. Another way of thinking of taqwa is to be God-conscious, that you're constantly aware about God and your status as the servant of Allah. <coughs> but Imam al-Ghazali <coughs> wants to say something very interesting. He says, in the month of Ramadan, there are two conditions of the heart, the hal of the heart, which is during fasting and after the fast ends, which describes what is the meaning of the word muttaqin. <coughs> While you are fasting, you are in a state of vigilance, in a state of murahaba, constant vigilance. You want to make sure that nothing you do breaks your fast. You don't take anything in, your hands don't do anything, your eyes don't do anything, your tongue doesn't do anything, you don't say things, you don't hear things which will break your fast. So being a muttaqin while fasting is the fear, the constant alertness, the fear of doing something wrong that will break your fast. And once you break your fast, then taqwa becomes when your heart is like a pendulum. It oscillates between hope and fear. Hope and fear. So you hope that Allah has accepted your fast. 
And Allah has forgiven all your sins. And Allah is going to revive you with Jannah. On the day of Maghfirah, He is going to reward you by placing you among those who are closest to Prophet Sallallahu And on that, He will reward you by wishing you, seeing you, meeting you. So you have hope that your fast has been accepted. But your heart then oscillates to the other condition and then you have fear, oh my God, have I done something that might have broken this fast? So this condition of taqwa after the fast is the heart is like constantly, it's, it's like going up and down a roller coaster. The high of hope and the low of fear, the high of hope. And that is the meaning of taqwa in this ayah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have made fasting obligatory upon you so that you become taqwa. But now that you know the benefits of the month of Ramadan, the opportunities that the month of Ramadan gives to you, you have to be grateful to Allah. The month of Ramadan comes with a lot of blessings. And it would be extremely, I believe at least, that we are bordering on kufr if we do not recognize the blessings of the month of Ramadan and are grateful. If you are ungrateful when you get an opportunity to spend another Ramadan, who knows? I mean, there are still 12 days to go and it's possible that some of us may not be there, inshallah. I pray that all of us get an opportunity to have another Ramadan in our month. Let me share with you some of the blessings of the month of Ramadan. One of the blessings is that Prophet says that the dua, the supplication, the prayer of three people will never be unheard. There are three kinds of people whose dua will always be heard. And those three are, number one, a just ruler, a ruler who rules for the benefit of his people. And then dua and the supplication of those who are oppressed those who live under unjust rulers, the people who are suffering, people who are marginalized, people who are targets of discrimination and racism and poverty and sickness, all the refugees that you see today in the Muslim world. The Muslim world is in a state of fitna and azab. And we should all pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides relief to the refugees from Syria, to the refugees from Iraq, to the refugees from Burma who are running away for safety. They are running away from their homes which are supposed to be safe, in search of safety. And even Muslim countries are not responding to them. It is their dua that will be heard and not denied. And the third entity or the third person whose dua will also be heard is the one who is fast. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the biggest benefit of those who are fasting is that your supplication will be heard. So make good use of the month of Ramadan when you are fasting. It's to constantly be in a state of zikr and dua. Do as much dua as you can. Be shameless. Ask for everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if I give everybody everything that they ask, there will be no change in what I own. So there is no limit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give us. So that is the number one benefit is to ask. And let me tell you, not asking, even, even, even little things, you want a BMW, ask for it. Don't feel shy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not asking is a sign of arrogance. Not asking for what you want because he knows what is in your heart. He knows what you want. And if you do not ask, then you'll be proud even with God and that is a sign of kibbutz. The sign of arrogance, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not lack arrogance. If there is even a little iota of arrogance in people's heart, you are not going to Jannah. The second benefit, these are all summaries of ahadis, all from Bukhari, you can find them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those who fast with Iman and sincerity, they will be forgiven. All their sins will be forgiven. So you fast the month of Ramadan with the niya to please Allah, to fulfill the obligation of being a Muslim, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins. You pray at night with iman and sincerity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. And also, most importantly, maintain as much silence as possible. Read and remember. Read 
and remember. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do as much with zikr as possible. Even when you're talking to people, like when you stand outside the masjid and you're talking to people, better be among those who are listening than those who are speaking. The Prophet said, if you control the flesh between your jaws and between your thighs, you will go to heaven. Okay? At least the flesh between the thighs is constantly zipped up. It might not be a bad idea to zip up the flesh between the jaws also. Because every time you open your mouth, you run the risk of breaking your fast. You could say something which is not true. You could say something that will offend somebody. You could say something which constitutes backbiting. Even if it is true, it's the same. It will break your fast. So the less we talk, the better it is, inshallah. And another benefit of fasting is that it has an effect of purification. You know, these days, it's a big fad in the United States where people actually go out there and call it cleansing, where they live on juices, some weird juices for two or three weeks. They call it detoxing the body. Fasting is like that. It not only detoxes your body, but also your soul. Because when you're fasting, you're doing three things. Remember the three kinds of fasting. And, that, and if you follow at least the two, the first two ways of fasting, inshallah, you will become pure. So it has this effect of purification of the soul, the purification of the mind. For example, one of the things that I want to do this Ramadan is to not be on social media while I'm fasting. And I can tell you that if you are not on social media, it will have a purifying effect. Your mind is not bombarded with certain impulses and certain triggers which make you think of things that could break your fast. You don't know, you just log in and you see a picture that you should be seeing while you're fasting. So when you fast and you do it with clues, with vigilance, with attention, with aqua, this fear that I should not do something that will break my fast. Can you imagine the whole point of fasting every day, especially in this country, if you're working and fasting for 15, 16 hours, and, and then you're breaking those fasts and they don't count. It'll be quite tragic. So the three ways in which you can fast, and let me tell you what they are. One is fasting which are controlling appetites. Very simple. Abstaining from food, abstaining from drinking, and abstaining from sexual activities during your fast. So you are con controlling physical desires. And if you control physical desires, it's important that it will give you the self-discipline that you need to control other appetites. The appetite of anger, the appetite for arrogance, the appetite to gossip. It, the, this ability to control your hunger and your thirst and your sexual activity gives you the strength to control other desires. You become a person with self-control. That is one of the most important things that Ramadan teaches you. It's like a boot camp where you work out harder and harder to control yourself. So that is the first level of fasting, where you abstain from these three kind of activities. The second kind of fasting is the fasting of the organs in the mind. Keeping your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your hands, and your legs free from sin. Don't go where there is a chance of committing a sin. Don't listen to things that are sinful. Certainly don't see things which are sinful. Certainly avoid saying things that are sinful. Like you could be sitting and fasting all day long and gossiping. That fast doesn't count. There are enough examples in the life of Prophet Sallallahu where he has pointed out to people that you think you are fasting, but what you're doing is eating the flesh of your brother. When you talk negatively about somebody behind their backs, you are eating the flesh. That will break your fast. So this is the second type of fasting. If you do this well, control your physical appetites and guard yourself from committing sins potentially, then inshallah you will have the self-control that is needed for the purification of the soul and the mind. The third and the highest form of fasting is fasting from the world. Now that is a very difficult thing. It's probably not possible for those who work during the month of Ramadan is to continuously, in the state of fast, to think only of Allah to think of nothing else. 
there have been scholars in the past and teachers in the past who have considered that their fast was broken when they thought of something else. When they thought of something else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they are fasting, they considered that their fast was broken. Now this is a very high level, this is not obligatory obviously. You are working in your job, you have to think about profitability, marketability, productivity, whatever you're doing. But that level of fasting is an opportunity for those of us who stay at home in the month of Ramadan and those of us who are retired. For them it is a target that you come so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you think of nothing else but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was reading, one of the scholars said that in his view, if you spend the whole time preparing to break the fast, then it is kufr in his view. He says because, why are you, I mean, it's about fasting not about breaking fast. And he, he was very upset. This was Imam Ghazali talking about Baghdad in his times. People spend all day preparing to fast, as if it's a feast, as if it's a party. He said the whole point of fasting is not to eat, and all you're doing is eating. He said, imagine placing, I was thinking of it as a plate of biryani, imagine allowing a plate of biryani to come between you and God. That's what you're trying to do with this whole events, and the stars, and party-like <coughs> events. So the third level of fasting, this is, just, this is very important, this is the state of Ahsan where you are trying to make sure that any deviance from thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like breaking a fast. The Prophet says in a very interesting hadith, and I hope I have the time to do full justice to this hadith. This is the hadith of Qusli, which means the Prophet himself is saying, Qala Allah, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Qala Allah, Kullu amila ibn Adam lahu, illa asiyam that every deed that the son of Adam does, or all the amals of the son of Adam, are for him, for the act, for Adam. Except fasting. For innahu li wa ana ajzibi. So except fasting which is for me. So all the things that we do, our taking shakaba, our praying, our going to hajj, doing umrah, giving zakat, all our good deeds are for us, except fasting, which is for him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I will reward my servant for it. It's a very interesting thing. The Prophet never explained what he meant by it, and so there are lots of explanations by scholars and students of knowledge. <laughs> One of them is another hadith which explains it very easily. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when a person does good things, I will reward him 10 times or 700 times. So when you pray, remember, when we were talking about Isra and Miraj, we said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially wanted us to pray 50 times a day, and then he reduced it to 5 times, and he said, okay, you just pray 5 times, but I will count it as 50. So it's 10 times. So at the minimum, God will reward us 10 times for one good deed, but 700 times for it. But he's saying that there are no limits to fasting. I will give my servant whatever I want. He may give you 701, he may give him 700 million rewards for fasting. That is how some people have understood. Others have said that when you do other forms of ibadat, there is an opportunity to show off. Even when you're praying, when you're giving zakat, you can stand up and very proud and say, I'm going to give $10,000. And there is a lot of ana in it. So when you give this publicly announced, you're not only giving money for a guzid, but also you're buying public opinion. You're buying image. So there is an opportunity for people to show off in all the ibadahs that they are doing, except fasting. And so there is no opportunity to, for you to brag and show off when you're fasting. That is the opinion of one of the scholars. An explanation that I, at least resonated most with me, was that it is against fitrah. That fasting is against fitrah. 
Everything else, human beings have this desire to surrender to somebody. We all have the desire to have a God or God. And in societies which are become de-religious, they have human gods. This celebrity culture is like that. They worship it. Even among Muslims now, we have celebrity scholars and stuff. This desire to adore someone, this desire to adore someone better than you, this desire to worship somebody better than you, is a human choice. So all forms of ibadat that are there are natural to us. We have a natural inclination to it. But we also have a natural inclination for the instinct to survive, and that is to fast, uh, that is to eat. And fasting goes against that chakra. Fasting goes against the desire and that instinct to eat. That is why fasting is considered the most. I will briefly share with you the four pathways to having the most <laughs> spiritual Ramadan. Inshallah, in future football, I will unpack each one of them. The four uh, it's like, number one, silence. Maintain as much silence as possible during the month of Ramadan. At least make it a habit. And if you do it for a month, hopefully, inshallah, it will become a habit for the rest of the month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he creates this universe, he says, kun fayakun. So everything is discourse. This entire creation, this tajalli of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Allah speaking, as is the Quran itself. The Quran is the speech of Allah. So if you think of creation that you perceive as speech of God, then what is your responsibility as servant of God while Allah speaks? Listen. Do not interrupt when God is speaking. Shut up and listen. And that is what we should understand that in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reaching out to us with hidayah, with guidance, with benevolence, with opportunities. Listen, maintain silence. The second one is hunger. Hunger provides control, hunger provides purity, hunger provides a desire to become better. Your mind is not dull, your body is not dull when you're hungry. If you eat full, you will sleep, intellectually, spiritually. You always eat less on the normal day, and fasting will give you this hunger, will make you sharp in both spiritual and intellect. The other two are seclusion and vigilance. Vigilance is a form of taqwa, to be alert, not to do anything that is wrong. As you are alert during fast, not to do anything that will break your fast, make a habit of being alert, do not do anything, do not say anything that will displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Stay in a state of istikhama. One of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is samad. Khulwallahu ahad, Allah samad. Samad means everlasting, but it also means standing up, standing erect. And Imam Ghazali says that one of the purposes of Ramadan is to try to develop in ourselves this sifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is samad. Try to be steadfast. Do not waver in your iman. And that is the goal of Ramadan, to be able to have control over your appetites control over your mind, control over your soul, so that you are steadfast, you are like Samad, you are Abdus Samad. Right. And finally, seclusion. One of the problems is socialization. The more you socialize, the more you talk, the more your chances of breaking your fast and getting into trouble. So try to find lonely time as much as you can in the month of Ramadan. And in that lonely time, listen to the words of Allah. Read the Quran, listen to the Quran, and recite the zikr. Inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us all this opportunity to once again benefit and literally rob the month of Ramadan with all the benefits and opportunities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is placed in a way. I also pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides relief to all Muslims who are suffering all over the world. At this moment, let the wars recede, let there be peace. And let everybody also have the opportunity to enjoy this month of spirituality, of religiosity, of coming as close as possible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah ya'amilu bil-adli wal-ihsan wa itadil qurba wa yanqa al-fayshah wa al-munkar wa ba'idhku la'allakum tazakkaroon wa qimu salah.
أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله هيا للسلاة هيا للسلاة هيا للفلاة هيا للفلاة قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله سموا صفوفكم فإن تسوية الصفوف من تمام الصلاة الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا Do 
الفردوس نزلا خالدين فيها لا يبغون عنها حولا قل لو كان البحر مدادا لكلمات ربي لنفد البحر لنفد البحر قبل أن تنفد كلمات ربي ولو جئنا بمثله مددا قل إنما أنا بشر مثلكم يوحى إلي أنما يوحى إلي أنما إلهكم إله واحد يوحى إلي أنما إلهكم إله واحد فما فليعمل عملا صالحا ولا يشرك بعبادة ربه أحدا الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله